Mike, it's great that you've joined us. Um, you joined the original lineup to make sure that our strap line, every generation for a sustainable future really had meaning. Uh, I'm really looking forward to hearing you speak. So uh, I'll just introduce you briefly to say that you're a climate activist in, Gl activist in Glasgow, but in your life you've been a farmer and a paediatrician. Great to have you with you. Over to you, Mike. Once upon a time, there was a boy. He was born at a time when a huge war was breaking out across the world. All round him, bombs exploded. He watched planes shooting at each other over his head. Everybody was scared. Some of his friends didn't have fathers because they'd been killed in the fighting in France. Everything seemed to be in a muddle. The story I've started to tell you is about my life. It's mainly about how I tried to make sense of the muddle I noticed around me in the world. The world you've been born into is an even more of a muddle than the one I was born into. The same muddle that caused the war at the beginning of my life has grown. It's caused other wars and a lot of other trouble. The biggest trouble of all that it's caused is the change in our climate. A change which has already forced millions of people to leave their homes and millions of wild animals and plants to die. The way it's headed, this change will steadily threaten the existing existence of all living things, including human beings. I've been lucky to live a long life, surviving wars, recovering from illnesses, running out of money, then finding enough to live on again, and somehow staying out of prison. As I come towards the end of my life, perhaps I may be able to help you who are near the beginning of yours by telling you the six main things I've learned about the world along my journey, not as some sort of storybook hero, but just as a fellow human being. The first thing I learned was that the world really is in a muddle. It wasn't just me thinking it was. To begin with, I wondered whether it was because I was too young to understand or too stupid and that really everything was okay. Then I slowly became more confident that I was right. The world really is in a muddle, the biggest muddle it's ever been in since the beginning of human history. So if you find the world confusing, you're right. I can tell you for sure, it's the world which is confused, not you. The second thing I learned, I began to learn soon after I started school, where I was given maps of the world to color in, a different color for each country. Pink was the color for Great Britain. A funny name in itself, I thought. Why not Great France or Great Germany? And I couldn't understand why so much of the world had ended up pink. None of my teachers explained it to me. It was difficult too, because I kept running out of pink crayons. Much later, I discovered that Great Britain owned so much of the world because it had stolen it. Great Britain was able to do this because it was the richest country in the world until the beginning of the 1900s when other countries like Germany and the USA began to catch up. Great Britain used its money to build up the biggest army, navy and air force so that it could invade lots of other countries. It grew to be the biggest empire in the history of the world with huge amounts of land for growing food, for planting trees, for timber and rubber, and for mining precious things like coal and gold to make it still richer. Enough was never enough. The third thing I learned was that the world is unfair. I learned this pretty fast when I was a children's doctor, first in Africa, then in Newcastle, and what I learned really shocked me. I was shocked to discover the huge difference between the daily experiences of the people who had enough or more than enough money to live on and those who were so short of money that they had to choose between a cold house or going hungry. And I noticed that this difference was in, as big in Newcastle as it had been in Africa. Because children in poor families often get serious illnesses, I learned a lot about poverty as a children's doctor. 
I was also shocked when I realized that many rich people didn't seem to care much about unfairness, even though they often lived quite close to poor people. The gap between rich people and poor people has got still bigger in recent years. The fourth thing I learned happened after I stopped being a doctor and became a farmer in Cumbria. Growing up in London, I didn't see much in the way of animals or trees or flowers. And when my parents took me to church, I was told that all the other living things in the world had been created for human beings to use as they wanted. But when I started to be a farmer, I began to realize just how much humans depend on plants, insects, birds, and animals for all their food. And through working outdoors every day, I came to respect and love all the other forms of life around me. Suddenly the world became a bigger and more beautiful place for me. As those of you who are growing up in the countryside, for example, Cumbria, one of the most beautiful and wildlife rich parts of Britain will have learned much earlier than I did. Learning the fifth thing was painful. I learned it, as they say, the hard way. About 20 years ago, around the beginning of the century, a big movement called Transition Towns swept across Britain, then became international. The idea was that if the people living in a town or village got together and agreed to eat only local organic food, to improve the insulation in their houses and put on an extra jumper when the house was cold, to travel by bike, bus or train and never by air, and to recycle their waste, they could stop climate change. In Brampton, a village in Cumbria, we were one of the first communities to grab this idea. And I spent 10 years or so fully committed to it. We carefully measured the carbon footprint of our community at the start, but when we measured it five years later, we were horrified to find that despite the efforts of most people in the community, we were emitting even more greenhouse gases than before. So I learned that however hard individuals try to reduce their emissions, and however well they work together as a community, they just weren't going to stop climate change. I was disappointed big time. The worst of it was that at that point, I didn't understand why. It took me a few years to understand why we'd failed. The reason I've come to realize is very simple, and I often wonder why I didn't understand it before. So this is the last of the six things I've learned, which I want to pass on to you, and it's the most important. Because if this isn't understood, there's no chance that we can stop the climate changing or the deaths of millions of people across the world or the extinction of all those wild things which are in danger, including human beings. If you want to do something, whatever it is, but someone else wants to stop you from doing it, who wins will depend on how powerful you are and how powerful the person or people are who want to stop you. When we were small children and we wanted to do something which our parents didn't want us to do, our parents could stop us simply because they were bigger and stronger and faster. When we grew to be as big and strong as our parents or our teachers, it became a matter of authority. Even if you are bigger than your teacher, you're supposed to obey them, which makes it kind of tricky to wrestle them to the ground. Once you've left school, who wins becomes a matter of who has more money, because money can buy power. When we're talking about trying to stop climate change, the people who are in our way trying to stop us are the 100 or so biggest businesses in the world, businesses like Tesco, Shell, GlaxoSmithKline, and Barrett's, who between them control the way we live, what we eat, what energy we use, what medicines we take, and what sort of houses we live in. Put together, businesses like these have a huge amount of money. With that money, they can work together to control the policies of governments, and with that money, they can control what goes out on television or is printed in the papers. They are desperate to stop us in our efforts to slow down or reverse climate change. Because if we succeed, they will lose money, a lot of money. If one of these businesses loses money, it will be likely to go bust. 
because the financial system we live under is based on fierce competition between businesses. I live in Glasgow now and I'm learning the next thing I want to understand, how we can win the fight against big businesses. If you like, we can talk about that later. That was going to be all I wanted to say when I was invited to speak to you today. Since then, the world has changed. A tiny virus has changed the world more over the last month than in any of, than in any of the 973 months I've been alive. Over this month, I've learned a seventh thing. People across the world have risen up to challenge this virus in their communities. And they aren't afraid to challenge their governments, who wanted at first to sacrifice older people for the sake of money. This has taught me that real change is possible. It's frightening. People are dying around us. Our governments have failed us. But the virus has brought with it a determination among people everywhere to change the way our world works. Arundhati Roy, the Indian writer and climate activist says, another world isn't just possible. On a quiet day, I can hear her coming. Thanks for listening to my, the story of my life. I know I can trust you to make sure another world arrives.